Hi everyone, I'm Michelle White. I'm senior curator at the Minnell Collection here in Houston. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to Texas Talks Art, uh, as well as the Minnell's ongoing Artist Talk series with Rick Lowe. Um, this this uh, program today is being held in collaboration with Texas Talks Art, which is a really exciting program that was initiated early this year. It's an initiative intended to introduce the world and work of artists across the state of Texas to a wider audience. And it's taking the form of these virtual conversations at noon every Tuesday. Um, and already we have over 50 Texas artists or artist collectives, as well as Texas curators uh, lined up. The talks are always free and they take place every Tuesday. If you wanna know what's upcoming, please visit texastalksart.org. Um, I'm going to remind you before we start that we love questions, so please send them right away and I'll be getting them in my feed. You can send your questions to programs at manil.org. So I'm pleased to welcome Rick today. Here he is. Hi, Rick. Hi, Michelle. Rick's joining us from his studio in Houston. And I should say before I introduce you formally, uh, this is also your first day of school. Yes. <laughs> so, I'm, always very, I'm always very nervous about the first day. I've been doing it for a while, but I'm still just first day jitters. <laughs> is, it in, is it in person or over Zoom? Well, actually, um, I scheduled the class for in person, but I'm getting lots of messages from students that are concerned about that. So we're going to try to figure it out. First okay. day is going to be out in the, you know, out in the wilderness somewhere. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll like just meet up out on campus somewhere. You know? yeah. Well, happy first day. And thank you for doing this on your first day because it is always stressful. And uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Rick Lowe, I'm going to give you a brief introduction. Clearly he's teaching at the University of Houston um, and has been for the last few years in the interdisciplinary studies department. Um, and I think for all of us here in Houston, Rick is uh, so important to our community here. Uh, his achievements in the international art world have truly been underscored by his commitment to championing people and communities through a social-based practice. He was born in Alabama he studied as a painter at Columbus State College in Georgia uh, before moving to Houston in 1985. Um, and something really like amazing about your story is how you first started working with John Biggers on his uh, mural projects and how that really kind of influenced your understanding of the relationship of art in a social space. Um, this is really when Rick uh, turn to the more sort of conceptual focus of his practice, uh, thinking through Joseph Boy's understanding of social sculpture. And this is when, in the early 90s, he was a co-founder of Project Row Houses in Houston's Third Ward. And for the next 25 years, uh, Rick served as the director. He grew the organization, uh, bringing in so many programs from the Young Mothers programs to after-school initiatives. And this is all was all alongside, which continues to be an internationally acclaimed schedules of exhibitions, artists in residence, um, uh, among other programs that have really served as such an important part of this community. Uh, Rick, you also have so many accolades, which I'm not going to list. He was Texas Artist of the Year through the Houston Art League. He was appointed to the National Council of Arts by President Barack Obama in 2013, and he was also named a MacArthur Fellow uh, the year after that. Um, and again, you're in Houston, you're teaching at the University of Houston, and Rick, oh my gosh, you have had a remarkable summer. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us about uh, your exhibitions this past summer? Because I have been watching uh, from afar and I'm in complete awe. It's, it's been, and Michelle, it, it really has been really interesting, you know, kind of, you know, the whole arc of the work that I've been doing, you know, from, you know, early on studying landscape painting, right? Very traditional landscape painting 
and rejecting that and doing more, you know, kind of anti-painting, uh, you know, propaganda kind of stuff, you know, dealing with political issues and so on and so forth. And, uh, and then getting into social sculpture stuff and community engaged work and all that kind of stuff. And then coming back to painting in a different way, you know, it's, and all of that stuff came together this summer in a real interesting way. Um, so for instance, going, has, having a wonderful opportunity to spend, uh, getting a private tour uh, with the, the curators and board member at the Frick of the new Frick, right? Um, uh, because I was telling one of, my, one of the people that's collecting my work uh, that I used to be a landscape painter and we were talking about that and I was talking about how much I liked, uh, you know, Camille Corot, you know, and, and all these, all these painters. That, and she was like, oh, well, you know, you got to take a tour. So, you know, doing that, you know, it was incredible. But the summer, you know, embodied so much of everything that I've been working on, right? So taking me all the way back to my early days of thinking about Camille Corot, but also uh, developing a project for the Tulsa, uh, the 1921 Tulsa Massacre Centennial in Tulsa. It's called the Greenwood Art Project. So we opened that in uh, 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 May 31st for the Centennial. And then uh, there's an exhibition, a group exhibition that I was fortunate enough to be in at uh, Gagosian uh, called Social Works, uh, curated by Antoine Sargent. And, um, and that was actually, um, you know, that was, you know, I never thought that I would be in a you know commercial exhibition, you know in in New York, you know and uh, and uh, you know so that was you know amazing experience and then um, and then kind of rounding it off by a project that, that I've been working on with the Smart Museum called the Black Wall Street Journey, and uh, and that show opened uh, on the fifteenth of uh, of uh, of July. And it's still going. So all of the and so all of these things are just kind of opening up all kinds of stuff for me right now. So it's, it's very exciting. And I think that's what's fascinating to watch you too, Rick, because you know I, I visited you in the studio and you have this like extreme like painterly studio practice in the most traditional terms, but you are working alongside you know your kind of social practice too, and it's just. It seems to be coming together so seamlessly. Um, watching yeah. you, yeah, it's really interesting uh, that you say that. You know, because I, I, you know, my, as I said, my early training was very traditional. You know, painting stuff, but it was really interesting that um, the curator who curated me into Documenta fourteen, uh, Monica, she um, we, on some of the visits we would just walk the streets of Athens. We're walking around, and you know. It, that was like 2016 and I wasn't really painting then. I was still just doing what I, I've always done, right? It's like looking at detailed things, taking photographs of them and like, you know, just, you know, and, and she would like, she would look at, she asked to look at some of the images and she goes, you're such a painter, <laughs> you know, even though I, you know, I wasn't really painting, you know, but that was just her, her take on it, you know, and I was uh -huh. like, yeah, I guess I am somehow deep down I am. But I mean, Rick, what's amazing too is it was really like around 2017, right, where you started making the the domino drawings and paintings. So it really did kind of um, come together pretty fast, um, yeah. and not that long ago. How you kind of approached um, your studio practice so differently? Yeah, it it, it happened very, very, very quickly, and. Uh, and I, I, have, I, I, was, I tell this story because it was something that was unsuspecting to me. Um, uh, my one of my mentors here uh, in Houston, Jesse Lott, uh, someone that I spend lots of time playing dominoes with and talking to, and all this stuff. And uh, we had this interesting situation. We were playing dominoes, and there was this uh, gallery here in Houston wanted Jesse to do a show with him. And uh, and Jesse also has this practice where he train artists within, you know. You know, he just trained artists all the time, you know, people from the community. You know, he had this story once he told uh, one of the young mothers at row houses who had been shopping and she had some milk and cereal and he's asked her how much it costs. And it was like five bucks or so for both. And he says, well, when you finish with that, you come back, I'm going to show you how to turn that into 50 bucks, you know, because I'll show you how to make something with it. So he does this stuff and he teaches people, but he also tries to get them to give them opportunities to show. Uh -huh. So he told that dealer, he said, I'll do a show with you if you allow me to show some of my 
people in the community that I taught. And, um, and the person looked at, uh, said to Jesse, he said, okay, well, I'll let you do that if you get Rick Lowe to be in the show. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, so Jesse like puts the phone down and he says, okay, you heard that, you know, you got to make something for the show. And that's when I kind of initially started that whole thing, you know, just kind of I just pulled out a piece of paper and I said, let's, because I've been taking photographs of these domino games, you know, just, just because I like the shapes and how things move and uh -huh. that kind of stuff. And so I just I put a piece of paper down and we played a game of dominoes. I traced it out and traced another one. I said, okay, there's your drawing. And he was like, Okay, <laughs> so it just kind of started in a very, you know, you know, unassuming kind of funny way. You know? Right, but but it's not right. I mean, it's it's th that that content, that form, that that way of thinking comes out of your your community and this really important part of you know. I have a picture here of you here playing with. Uh, Jesse, that was in the the catalog, which I love. But like, I I, I like this picture too, just as a, a visual to see how you were inspired, um, and it was ignited by playing dominoes, uh, and quite simply, but then has such larger ramifications on the interaction that you're exploring and the tension between this history of abstract painting and the social space. Well, you know, yeah, the domi the, the domino table. I I, I, I did a show at um, uh, Louis Alexander uh, uh, AF Projects back in 2018, and I titled it uh, the Humility Table. You know, because that's kind of a uh, that's kind of a terminology that people you know use kind of in the community playing dominoes. It's like you know, it, it teaches you humility. You know, because there's this always you know, it's a very a, it's, a, it's, it's an intense activity, you know? It, I mean, I've had people to sit down who were just, um, you know, people that just kind of passing through and they see us playing dominoes, they don't want to play and they sit down and immediately they know this is like really intense, you know, because there's so many layers of things going on. There's a game going on, but there's the politics of the world that people are kind of layering in the conversation. There's so much stuff. I mean, people that are, you know, that, you know, who are not formally educated at all, but they bring their, you know, their, their brilliance and their observations of the community, the world right there to that table and it gets shared and kind of spread around. So it's a really, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a seriously impactful uh, uh, thing for me to kind of engage in. Yeah. And that's what I think is so important about this work is not to see this as like, oh, you know, Rick Lowe and Project Row Houses has made this huge shift to painting, which I think could be like an easy way of seeing this, but like how integrated these paintings are to everything you've done before. And I was listening to that Gagosian talk you did with Thelma Golden and David Atche last night, which I would recommend to everyone. It's such a beautiful conversation, but you said something in that talk that really stood out that, that you said the domino paintings really represented the culmination of your work thus far. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you know, the, the the one thing that that happens in social and community engaged work is that, you know, you're you you're, you're you're charged with kind of having answers. You know, the work is to answer questions that that's happening in the community. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the forefront of it, right? But there, but in all art, there's always a, a, a an area of of questioning as well. You know. But you can't really focus on that in the community context because people are looking in the forefront for the answers to, to these these issues. But you know, when you, you know, being in the studio and being able to go back to painting, you know, I can go into all of that stuff in ways that is you know is very symbolic, you know, and and you know, and trying to you know to not focus on the answers, but really allow myself the the space to be. Uh, to have that kind of vulnerability that I do know, I know that I have it when I'm working in community projects, but I can't, you know, it can't be the, the, the front facing thing. Mm -hmm. you know? so, but when I get into the studio and I'm working on this work, I mean, I can, you know, all the doubts that I have and all the concerns that I have about the messiness of things and the, you know, the, the complexity, because people want simple answers too, you know, and, um, you know, and in the paintings I can, I can put forth things that are not simple. You know, there are no simple 
directives to the answers to how communities build. Yeah, and let's let's keep going with that because you know what you've also said is like talking about abstract works, like the one I have on the screen, which is is why we're having this talk too, because the Manil were so excited and proud to have been able to acquire this painting uh, from uh, your recent body of work that's currently on view at the Manil. Um, and you've talked about these two that I, I love, like this idea of this kind of like the complexity of, of a language that you're you're trying to use this kind of abstract language to sort of sort through the, the complexity of space itself. Yeah, trying to trying to scratch through, you know, because you know, often I mean, I've spent a lot of time looking at land maps, real estate maps, and you know, and they're always color coded, and they all have these kinds, of, and there, there's a certain kind of aesthetic around it, and uh, and it all has a kind of a linearness about how it's presented, but you know, how do you dig through that to create what it is that you what what you desire to see? You know, I mean, these maps are great at showing you, you know, the as is, you know, that's, that, you know, that's pretty straightforward to say, oh, this is, this is, uh, 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 you know, this is commercial, this is residential, this is park, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's pretty straightforward, although there are some questions in that too, right? Mm -hmm. we'll never get to the, 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 the questions around ownership and that kind of stuff. But then when you start talking about, you know, what's possible, then it becomes very limiting you know, in terms of what the possibilities are. But like, for instance, if you look at a, a, um, a real estate map in 1992 that looked at where Project Row House is, you could have seen as this map that would have shown those properties as derelict, whatever, whatever, you know, and ready to be torn down. Uh, and then you could have looked at it as a map of, and this is real map too, right? A real map of replatting and turning that block and a half and the blocks around it into suburban style single family houses, right? I mean, that's the kind of logical place that you go from saying, you know, okay, this is derelict property and this and that, whatever. But then there was something else that was underneath that, that we managed to scratch out. Mm -hmm. You know, it had a deep value for, you know, uh, in terms of history and all that stuff. Um, that, that, was, that, was, that was not, it was not present on the surface, you know? And so, you know, so in my, in my community engaged work, I'm always trying to scratch out and find out, you know, where those things that then fit the linear narrative. And, um, uh, but it's hard, it's hard, you know? And so it's great to be able to go to the studio and be able to have some kind of cathartic experience, uh, you know, feeling about the messiness, you know, and not feel like you're continuously, uh, you know, uh, yeah, stuck in the mud trying to move forward, you know. So. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important too, I was kind of going through your this series chronologically beginning in, you know, just a few years ago in 2017, but your first drawings where you're using the dominoes as a sort of to trace and to build the composition are done on actual maps of uh, the location of Project Row Houses. Yep, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Um, so those early, early drawings as, I mean, you know, when I first started looking at the, 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 the shapes that were developed through the playing of the games, in, in and by themselves, they're not very, they're not necessarily map-like. But then when you start to layer them, then it begins to be map-like. And then that's when I started to think about, you know, where does, where does the mapping, all the mapping experiences that I have and all this stuff of looking at real estate in the third ward and that kind of stuff, where, do, where, where does it fit and how does it fit within this layered kind of uh, chaotic mapping of these domino shapes? You know, I mean, how does it fit? Can you find it in there somewhere? And that was kind of the, the beginning and the excitement of that journey. But I would tell you about this particular painting. What was interesting about this painting was that <clears throat> Well, part of my process though was that early on it was it was you know just the tracing of the dominoes then it was the drawing of the dominoes without the tracing then it was a painting of the, the domino shapes whatever but this is the first painting that uh that i you know i i started using the collage and this is the very first one that i um you know i i felt like the um uh the uh, the paintings that I was doing at the time, they had a kind of a, there was, 
the texture was not as rich as I was wanting and, and, and shooting for. And, um, and so, you know, I just thought, well, maybe if, if I didn't, uh, if, if I didn't draw out the dominoes or whatever, maybe I could just make them, you know, and start to play the games, you know, within a structure in itself. And so this was a, this was the beginning of that, you know, of trying to figure out, you know, how to, to even take the game a little bit further away from the reality of sitting at a domino table. Mm -hmm. And and that's, you know, now that you're talking, I've always been in being with this work for a while, thinking about how you're cutting out the shapes and collaging it on the surface as an additive process. But now, like you're suddenly making me realize how it's also a sort of gesture of excavation where you're sort of removing layers of paint, you're scrubbing it. And in some cases you're using like a, like a <laughs> mechanical sander, is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, um, you know, I, I, I remember, um, you know, I was, you know, when I was early on kind of, you know, making work and I, you know, I'm constantly talking to artists about stuff, you know, and, and I remember talking to, um, um, talking to an artist who was just saying, you know, yeah, you know, I mean, just, you know, dig in, you know, you know, you're, you're, you're scratching at things philosophically and conceptually, just physically, you know, scratch in, you know, and so, so, uh, so I started to, uh, you know, once I start to layer uh, the collage work, then I would sand them down, you know, and see what was left. And then I go back over and sand them down. And I put, yeah, so sometimes, you know, my studio is just a dust bowl, you know, it's a dust bowl of, of you know, yeah sanded particles all over the place and that. Uh, yeah. But gosh, it's just where your like form and content just come together. And like even thinking about a metaphor of like what you do in, in, in the sort of social practice of excavating history and digging into like, you know, the land and history of the land itself, you're, you're kind of enacting that through this kind of formal process with, with this genre of art making that is ensconced in, tradition and it's remarkable yeah you know it's funny how you say that because i also like i would i would do i i, I carry over these things from both sides right from the you know the more traditional art side you know i carry some of my the language and my learnings from that into my community engaged work and then i'm doing the same like for my community engaged work to the arts i mean to the you know the the studio work whatever as i would always tell people like doing community engaged projects one of the um one of the things that I'm, I'm always reminded of is starting a community engaged project is just like starting a painting right you have a blank surface and you have to start you have to make a choice of where you're going to start you know how do you want to just jump in and go and, you know, and so oftentimes I'm working on a community engaged project and I'm like, going, I don't quite know where to go. I don't know how it's, you know, I don't know where it's, and then I just remind, I go back to those old teachings, you know, you just have to start, find your spot and start. And then you can kind of, you know, shift and move things, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, so I I, I, uh, I, I I use that all the time, but then from the other side, sometimes when I'm working on these pieces, I, 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 I have to watch myself and I tell myself, don't gentrify. <laughs> don't gentrify this image right you know because sometimes you know you know i have a tendency you know I'll, i have a tendency like things get like a little too luscious or too pretty kind of stuff it's like no 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 and that give me a you know reason i'll go and i'll sand stuff out you know kind of stuff it's just to kind of because I, I like you, you know the this work comes out of a kind of a gritty context right? i mean mm -hmm. you know uh you know i think of you know some of my best education has come from the domino table and, and, and that's not, you know, that's far from the halls of universities, you know, the formality of universities and all that kind of, you know, smoothness, but it's, it's very real and it's very valuable, you know, and I value that, you know, the kind of the, you know, the, 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 the grittiness, you know, the tables, the domino tables, you know, one, maybe one day I'll just go around and I'll through the community, I'll start collecting domino tables because it's interesting, you know, you go to different places, that table that you showed at Project Pro Houses, that, that table, that table, its existence has been from 1996 as the domino table. I mean, and you can just see like the mark on it and all this stuff, you know, and you know, it's just, it's, yeah, you know, it's, a, I, I love the surfacing of what, what the, the game is and how it's played out and the kind of, 
yeah, the grittiness of it and bring that into the work. I, it's there. I mean, the tactility of work like this, here's a detail. Um, you have that sense even of touch and how you like sanded down parts and it's, it's pretty wonderful in that way. Um, but can we, can we go back to your use of the term gentrification? Because that's, <laughs> but I know I, I have to say, like, as we're talking about your domino paintings more as, as in terms of like topography and as a, almost like a sort of exercise in grappling with a changing landscape, a changing world. I mean, certainly gentrification becomes the content of this work as well. Mm -hmm. To me, anyway, looking at it from outside. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, it's um, you know, part of part of the part of this, you know, me exploring this work is a kind of way of like, you know, how do I, as you know, even you know, as an artist, you know, enter into this world of, you know, where their works going in the collections and that kind of stuff. You know, what does all that mean? You know, mm -hmm. taking this stuff, this gritty stuff, out you know, and, and, uh, and, and putting it in a different context. Um, you know, I mean, fortunately for, for me, I mean, I just, I've always had a, a thing for painting, you know, and I've, you know, I, and, um, and, you know, but also because I've always felt the urgency of social and political issues that I denied myself, you know, that privilege, you know, that privilege to be able to kind of remove myself from the urgency of the day to day to be able to kind of pull back and look at something in a more, uh, more, you know, sublime way, I guess. And, uh, and, um, you know, so, so, so this notion of, of, of gentrification, you know, comes at me from so many different ways, right. From the actual surfaces of the work to how the work, you know, manifests itself in the world and all of that stuff. And I think just being in Houston and, and, uh, you know, the even situation of where project row houses is, is where your studio is that the sort of, what gentrification means and how complicated it is as not just a sort of neat positive negative in many ways. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I really run into that with the um, the series that I was working on that's, that's at, you know, in that exhibition at Gagosian uh, called the Black Wall Street Journey. You know, I mean, you know, there's so many things about gentrification that it's, uh, that, you know, it's just not simple, you know, and we always, as I said, we're always looking for simple answers, you know, and so that, that makes things a little bit uh, challenging because, you know, if you look deeper, they're, they're very complicated things. So, you know, the notion of gentrification, I mean, what does it mean when there are, uh, you know, uh, middle-class African-Americans coming back, you know, or going into an area and, you know, the, real estate prices and values are shifting because of that. You know, I mean, is that a bad thing? You know, looking at the Black Wall Street journey became, you know, complicated because, you know, we like many of us in the, uh, you know, in the black community, we like to, you know, think back historically, romantically about, you know, uh, 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 pre-integration in which black neighborhoods were strong. You know, I mean, they were relative to you know, to, to how they are now. But um, but what we kind of forget, though, is that, well, you know, I mean, there was a forced uh, cohesion there. You know, I mean, it, it, you know, the you know, the, the multi layers of economic economics existing in black communities uh, prior to integration uh, were not by choice, you know, and so now we're in a situation where it's not so simple, you know, mm -hmm. It's much more complex to look at, you know, how do you think about Black Wall Street in the 21st century? It's fascinating. And I, I, I would encourage everyone to look at the Gagosian show. And there's such a wonderful group of essays and interviews, including one you, you, you've you been a part of many of these that really expands on, on this, this idea and these questions. Um, OK, so Rick, if you can believe it, we're almost out of time. And I have tons of questions for you. Um, we could keep this going a long time, but you know, one thing, you know, when you were talking about the relationship about uh, abstract painting and the sort of urgency of, sort of contemporary politics or uh, within a, a social space, 
you know, I think here in Houston and at the Manila, we've been thinking about this a lot is it's the 50th anniversary of the deluxe show this year. And certainly the conversation that happened in 1971 in the fourth ward with the deluxe show was also kind of about this intersection uh, in a particular social space. And I, I know we don't have time to go into the history of the deluxe show, but I would just love your thoughts on how you see your work um, in relationship to the the dialogue that that was um, really sort of started in an interesting way in the early 1970s in in Houston. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I'd say is that you know, and that's. You know, I mean, the, the Manils have been celebrated for this, you know, over and over of their, you know, deep down desire to really, you know, uh, make sure that people understand that there's art around them and make sure that art is available to them and the, and the power of that, right? I mean, that's a, it's, it's something that was, um, I mean, in, that, in the deluxe show, uh, manifest that with them investing the way that they did in the Fifth Ward you know, and, you know, a place that, that wasn't really a place known for, you know, contemporary art. And, uh, and so with someone like me, it's, it's, it's very interesting. My studio is in the heart of Third Ward. I mean, I'm on a block of, you know, little, you know, bungalow, shotgun house type, you know, and you know, I've added a little extra space to mine. But, but, but still, you know, here I am, you know, the space and, you know, kids on the block in the neighborhood, you know, they'll, come in, they poke around, they see like these big paintings kind of leaving. They're like, oh, what's that? You know, and, you know, and, and it's like a whole, you know, and then they, you know, so it's interesting, you know, how just the presence of art within a place, it gives a different um, uh, window for people to see the world. You know, I mean, you know, and they will ask me and, you know, and we have these great, interesting little conversations. They say, oh, well, well, that's going to, that painting is going somewhere in Europe somewhere. That painting is going, you know, it's like, it's going there, you know, and they're like, really? What? You know, it's like, you know, so it's, it's very, very, you know, interesting, uh, uh, the impact that, that art and artists can have when they're embedded within communities. And it's not even something that's a program thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's just being, having the presence of someone who's doing something that is different. It's something that is also, uh, that, that, you know, kind of guide people into this state of wonder. You know, it's like, what is this stuff? You know, what are these shapes? What are you doing with that? Why do you put that there? We hear sanding and stuff. We hear this now it's doing the data. What's happening there? What's, you know, so they're always the stuff and they're always curious to come in. And unfortunately with COVID, I'm not so open for people just coming in and out, but you know. Yeah. But I've been to your studio and you can get peaks of what's happening from the street in a pretty yeah. interesting way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Rick, we're going to end, but in all of the Texas Talk Art series, um, uh, ends with a question, and here's yours, is what's your favorite work in a Texas museum and why? Yeah. Well, that, it was, uh, that's, that's a very uh, challenging question because, you know, uh -huh. I mean, Texas, we got a lot of great stuff here, you know, even just in the city of Houston, but, you know, throughout. and. Um, and I came up with one that's not, it's not proper, it's not a museum proper, I guess, but it is associated with a museum. And it came out of that. And that's the Rothko Chapel. And, and the, you know, and, 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 I, and I know it's a little cheap because it's not like a, I see the chapel as a work. And that's, and, and, and that's why, you know, it is the, you know, my favorite and, and, and most significant for me because, you know, it embodies all these things that I really, you know, care about, you know, and uh, I mean, you know, the paintings are great, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I love those paintings, but I also, I love how they function, you know, I love how they function within that space. And, um, and, you know, I mean, I'm into, you know, you know, the, the, the Rothko Chapel, you know, in a sense, it is, um, it, 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 it functions, the way that I would ideally like for my work to function, you know, in the sense that, you know, if you think of something like Project Row Houses, I mean, you know, people 
really get into you know the kinds of things that it's doing within in the within the community but i don't think there's a lot of room for people or, or people spend a lot of time really reflecting on you know these kind of deeper uh, this deeper emotional journey you know intellectual quest that that project is all about for me you know i mean you know and, and i guess probably there are many people that don't get that about roscoe chapel as well but you know anyway <laughs> that's a great answer um rick thank you for taking the time today this was a pleasure and let's keep the conversation going um uh rick's work is up up, uh, up at the museum here at the manil uh, for another few weeks um and i'll thank everyone for joining um this program has been recorded and we'll be putting it up on the manil's youtube channel in the coming weeks and Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of the supporters of A Texas Talks Art. And uh, uh, please join for more sessions uh, every Tuesday. So thanks, everyone. And thanks, Rick. It was great to see you. Fantastic.